the main idea in last lecture was the OS is in the so last lecture was all about understanding how interrupt drive an operating system. And we looked into four different kinds of interrupts. So let's uh, spend the, the first 10 minutes reviewing these uh, interrupts and uh, understanding how they uh, drive the operating system, because this is a very important concept. So what are the four different kinds of interrupts that we studied last time? Okay, number one. Exceptions. Okay, exceptions. So when do exceptions occur and how do they, how are they used to control the system? Why, how, how are they used? What's the, the, the point in having exceptions? Yes. So when do they occur? Um, for example, when a user program is trying to use a privileged instruction that's reserved for them. Okay, so this is one example, but generally speaking, when do exceptions occur? It's an error, like divided by zero or something like that. Yeah, this is another example. So when, the, when a process is trying to do something wrong, when a process is trying to do something that it's not supposed to do, something invalid, like accessing a memory location that does not belong to it, and we will understand how this generates an exception when we get to memory management uh, towards the end of the semester. Other examples are divide by zero, uh, stack overflow, floating point overflow, uh, trying, attempting to execute an, a privileged instruction, an instruction that a process is not allowed to execute, or trying to execute an invalid uh, an invalid instruction. Like you are trying to run uh, you know, a program uh, that is compiled for, uh, say, uh, you know, an, uh, an, uh, an ARM machine on an Intel processor. So you're trying to, to, uh, to execute uh, an invalid binary for that particular machine. So that will get caught as an invalid operation. Now, when these exceptions occur, what happens? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the OS gets control and determinates the process that is trying to do something wrong. And that provides protection. That protects the system. So the idea here is that if a process, if one process is trying to do something wrong, then we should terminate that process in order to protect the system. Otherwise, if we allow a process to do that, it may, uh, it may crash the whole system. In particular, if it's trying to do an out-of-bound memory access, it may crash the system. OK. Uh, what's the second kind of interval? I.O. completion. Okay. When does that get generated? Who generates the, the I.O. completion interrupt? Yes. Yes, yeah, you. And the I.O. device. The I.O. device. When? When it finishes its uh, task and process. Yeah, when it completes, uh, when it completes processing an I.O. request it generates an I.O. completion interrupt. And what's the purpose of that interrupt? How does it, what happens when that interrupt gets generated? Uh, yes, please, same person. Yeah. It lets OS know, hey, I'm done. Have the data available when you need it. Oh. So that interrupt will give control to the operating system, to the kernel, like all interrupts. When any of these interrupts, uh, when any of them happens, Control is given to the operating system. So that's, uh, you know, that's why these interrupts allow the operating system, the kernel, to stay in control. So this is the second kind of interrupts. There is a third. What's number three? OK, timed interrupt.
Okay, so how do these get generated and how do, what do they have? What's the purpose of these? Yes. It's a process will hog all the resources at the same time, or all the resources at once. It just kills it after a certain amount of time, like 10 milliseconds. Kills what? The process. Kills the process? Not kills it, but gives it to another process. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, killing is... <laughs> is illegal. <laughs> well, it's not. In fact, you know, sometimes operating systems kill processes. Like we said, if it's a, if a, you know, if a, if a process, if an exception gets generated and the process is trying to do something wrong, then it's legal for the operating system to kill a process. But it's only legal if the process misbehaves. The process does something wrong. <laughs> so there is a death penalty <laughs> in operating systems. And that's, uh, uh, it's legitimate when the process does something wrong. And it's legitimate because killing that process will protect the system. It will not allow one process to uh, crash the system. Now, with the timed interrupt, the operating system does not kill a process. It only takes the CPU back from a process. And the process. If a process is behaving well, if it's not doing anything wrong, it will keep getting you know, time, uh, time periods of, or time quanta. By the way, we call it time quantum. You know, that period of time that the operating systems give to a process on the CPU, we call it a time quantum. So a process will get enough time quanta to complete. Uh, but how long is this time quantum? And how many? Uh, how long is that time quantum? That's determined by the operating system. Right? So, so here there is no killing. It's just switching between uh, processes. Uh, yeah. Are the time interrupts common? Uh, time interrupts? Yeah, they call yeah. like two processes take a long yeah, time. Definitely. You know? Yeah, they, they, they happen very frequently because they will allow uh, the operating system to switch between processes. Uh, otherwise, one process may. Uh, they keep the CPU forever, right? Uh, you know, in, in, a, in a typical system that we use every day, uh, there are multiple processes running at the same time, and that's time sharing. They are sharing time, and without the time interrupt, the operating system will not be able to implement that. Okay? So now, uh, you know, the point here is that the operating system will keep switching between processes, and what's the purpose of switching between processes? Better user experience. What's that? Better like user response and experience. Yeah, yeah. It's user responsiveness and fairness to the users because these different processes may belong to the same user or to different users. Think of a server, like right? an operating system on a server, and multiple users are using that server. So, like you are using the Athena machine, and ten other students are using Athena at the same time. So, in that case, when you are using Athena, if it's not heavily overloaded, you, you, you don't feel any lateness. You feel like you know, the machine is all yours. You feel like you are the only user on the machine. But you're not the only user on the machine. You, there are other users, uh, and the, the operating system is just switching between users so frequently that each user is, gets the illusion that the machine is all yours, or all theirs. Okay, so that's this is the, the point in doing this uh, this kind of switching. Now in the in sec in the morning section, one student said that timed interrupt are good for uh, uh, terminating infinite loops. So if we have a program that does this, has an infinite loop in it, and say it doesn't have a break inside of the loop, it has a loop that loops forever. You know, what does an, a timed interrupt do in this case? How does, what, how does an, a timed interrupt interact with this? Will it just, does a timed interrupt terminate an infinite loop? Yeah, what will it do? Yes? Uh, wouldn't it just uh, halt the, in the middle of the while loop and then come back exactly where it was with the same, and continue the loop infinitely when, it, when the process is given back to the, uh, um, yeah. Control. Well, yeah, exactly. So it's say uh, you know the, the, suppose that the time quantum that is given for each process is ten milliseconds. So the system will give it ten milliseconds, 
And suppose that 10 milliseconds will execute this part of the loop. So 10 milliseconds will, after 10 milliseconds, we are here. Then the operating system is going to switch to another process. And it, it may give the CPU to uh, 10 or 12 other processes before it gives the CPU back to this process. And now this process is going to execute this. And it's going to, you know, this is after 10 milliseconds, the process could be here. So if, if in this example we assume that, uh, you know, the, the process, the, the, the body of the loop takes 20 milliseconds, the process will get two time quanta. But then, the next time around, it will get another time quantum and it will do this. And it will keep doing this forever. So the, the point here is that operating systems uh, are not even aware of infinite loops. Operating systems do not have a way of detecting infinite loops. And an operating system does not care. It doesn't care if, if, a, if a program is, an in, is in an infinite loop. Because if it's, uh, the, you know, if the, as long as the program is behaving well, the operating system doesn't care. So there are programs that run for long periods of time. There are programs that run for uh, you know, days or even weeks or months. Right? So if you, you can start your web browser today and you leave it running for weeks. It's typical. Right? You, don't, you, don't, uh, you don't terminate it. So it's t from operating system point of view, the program is still running, and as long as it's well behaving, the operating system is not going to do anything. So it's like, you know, the operating system is not like a, a, a human being who may get sick or tired of a program and say, oh, this program has been running for a long time, I'm going to kill it. No, it doesn't do this. As long as the program is behaving well and is not doing anything wrong, the operating system will keep giving it time quanta forever. But now, now, the point here is when the operating system keeps switching, you know, this, is an, this process is in an infinite loop, process number one is in an infinite loop, it gets some time quantum, and then the operating system is going to give time quanta also to other processes, to P2 and P3 and P4 and P5 and Pn. All other processes are getting their time quanta. So this program is stuck in an infinite loop, whether, it's, whether that's for a good reason or a bad reason. It doesn't matter. Other processes are making progress as well. And in fact, when we get to scheduling, when we study CPU scheduling, operating systems, we will see how an operating system will, will try to give more CPU time to processes that are active or interactive. A process that is doing more activity or interacting with the user is going to get more attention from the operating system, and the operating system is going to give it more CPU time. And we will see that when we get to CPU schedule. OK. Uh, any questions on this concept? Yeah. So basically, to summarize, the operating system does not detect an infinite loop. It does not terminate an infinite loop. But what it does here prevents an infinite loop from uh, you know, s s slowing the whole system or uh, killing the system. It does not kill the system. Other processes will be making progress as well. OK. What's the fourth kind of interrupt? System call. Yeah, system call. And what's the system call? What's the system call? It's a type of interrupt used by user programs to ask the OS for resources. Yeah, so it's uh, to ask the OS, well, it's, it's an application program. It's a, a way of an for an application program to ask the operating system for a certain service that only the operating system provides. All the services that are, uh, that, uh, that only operating systems are allowed to uh, implement so because they involve access to certain devices that only the operating system is allowed to access or to do certain privileged 
uh, perform certain privileged operations that the opera only the operating system is allowed to execute, anything of that sort, a user program is not allowed to do directly. It, it must go through the operating system. And it does that via a system call. System call is like making a function call. But it's a, a special kind of a function call where the implementation of that function call is in the kernel. Okay? So it's not implemented by a user level library, it's implemented by the system, by the operating system. And usually system calls are implemented using interrupts. Okay? Uh, you know, some machines have a system call in instruction, but it does the same thing basically. So it basically, uh, you know, it will do the same effect, you know, whether it's an interrupt or it's a system call uh, instruction that the user program executes. Either way, control will be given to the operating system somehow. It's basically the application program saying, now I need the operating system to do this for me, so now the operating system should get control.